Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for being here, all of you. Um, today I'm going to talk about what is new in .NET 7 and C Sharp 11. And I'm so happy that so many of you are here today. My first talk in Sweden. I've never seen a room full of Swedes like this. Um, so yeah, I don't have a lot of time, only 50 minutes uh, to explain all what is new in .NET uh, 7 and C Sharp 11. I was happy that past weekend I had enough time to visit Lisebeg, but today I only have 50 minutes. So let's go quickly, very quickly. My name is Johnny, uh, I'm from Belgium. Again, very happy to be here. Um, I work as a consultant, mostly in .NET backend development. Um, and I do this because it's fun to talk to people just like you. Everything that I will show you today is available on my GitHub page. There is a GitHub QR code on the right hand side. I think it will be on every slide, so you can uh, take a copy of that. There's also a link in the bottom. Um, so all of the samples are already on there. Even the slide tag, which is not too many slides, but it's also on there. So basically you can already go outside and see everything that I have to offer because it's already online. But of course, it's always fun to listen to this Belgian guy uh, talking about .NET. So um, first of all, I basically split up this talk into .NET 7 and C Sharp 11. But I think there's about three hours of content here. Um, so if you go to slido.com or um, or scan that QR code, I basically made a poll. A poll where you can vote as an audience what features you think are most interested, interesting, and I will talk about those features that have the most votes. If you don't vote, I will choose for you. Um, while you are doing that, while you are visiting Slido or scanning that QR code if you want, uh, use the has hashtag Svetu um, to get to the right poll. I will already show you very quickly what I can talk about. For example, the first thing, .NET Upgrade Assistant. So if you are still using .NET Framework, you can use the Upgrade Assistant to convert that uh, project to .NET Core or .NET 6 or 7. I can talk a little bit about MAUI. MAUI is not really new to .NET 7. It was new to .NET 6, not when it released, but a couple of months ago. Uh, but it will also be available in .NET 7, of course. And then a couple of things that are completely new in .NET 7. Uh, you can work with uh, tar archive files. You can do gRPC JSON transcoding. You have reg regular expressions uh, source generation, so you have more performant regular expressions. There is some additions and some customizations that you can now uh, work with on the system.text.json namespace, so you have more customiz customization options there. You can have metrics on your memory cache. There is now microseconds and nanoseconds when working with dates and times. There is more to do with math and generic math. Um, there's rate limiting inside of the framework available for you, so if you want to do rate limiting, for example, uh, rate limiting on the requests that comes into your ASP.NET pipeline, stuff like that. Um, there is some simplified link ordering available, and there is built-in SDK containerization support. Now, for C Sharp 11, there is auto-default structs, um, auto-fields, extended name of scope, there is generic attributes, finally. There is uh, interpolated strings where you can have holes, which sounds a little bit weird, but <laughs> Uh, very cool feature. There's more list patterns, there's raw string literals, there's UTF-8 string literals, and there's required properties. So these are all things that I can talk about. Now, let's see if people already voted. <laughs> so most people want to see C Sharp 11 stuff and .NET stuff, and then I can see some, some other things still changing. While you are still doing this for one more minute, I can explain for people who maybe don't know yet. So basically today, when you're completely new to .NET, it seems like there's three frameworks. There's .NET Framework, there's .NET Core, and there's just .NET, which are three completely different things. .NET Framework it was the old .NET, um, basically the one that I grew up with. Um, so .NET Framework today has the latest version of 4.8. Um, the first version of .NET Framework was in 2002. Um, and Microsoft decided to stop evolving that framework and to um, basically only do uh, bug fixes and security fixes. So if you are still using the .NET framework today, that's okay. There won't be a newer version, but your current version is still supported up until we have no idea as of right now. So it can be the next five years, it can be the next 15 years, we will see. 
I can't help you with that. Then in 2016, we had .NET Core, which was the new .NET. So they basically started from scratch, or at least Microsoft started from scratch, built a new, completely uh, platform-independent framework called .NET Core. And they did that up until version 3.1, which is still supported today, but will not be supported after the end of this year. So if you're still using .NET Core 3.1, the last version of .NET Core, um, you should migrate to uh, .NET 6 or 7 by the end of this year, because that will also go out of support. Which basically means that the remaining thing, just .NET, .NET 5, 6, 7, and so on, will be the only thing remaining that we should use to the future, in the future. Um, so, um, what else can I tell about that? Yeah, for .NET itself, I'm talking about .NET 7 today. .NET 7 will be released in November this year. Every new major version of .NET will be released every year. So next year we will have .NET 8, the year after we will have .NET 9, and maybe so on. Also important to know is that every even version of .NET will be a long-term support version. So .NET 6 is the last version, the one from November last year which will have a long-term support release cycle, which means it will be supported for up to three years. So from last year, three years onwards. .NET 7, an odd version of .NET, will only be supported for 18 months or one year and a half. So basically when you are going to use .NET 7, it's not a long-term support version, so you'll only be having support for 18 months which means that one year after .NET 8 will be released, so you basically have six months to upgrade your applications from .NET 7 to .NET 8. That's the idea. For the long-term support versions, you can basically go from 6 to 8. You can skip the, the in-between versions. But because Microsoft created .NET from scratch and also uh, wrote a new c -sharp compiler, it has become very easy for them to develop new features which means that we will see a lot of these new features every year. So if you want to use these new features, you have to jump to these newer versions. So you all are asking for C Sharp 11, so let's start with that. Uh, which one is it? Who knows, this one? Yes. So let's go from top to bottom. The C Sharp 11 features are actually quite uh, simple, so I can show you very quickly. Text large enough? Yep. Yes. Take one guy in the front. Yep. <laughs> so, auto default structs. Basically, when using an older version of C Sharp, like C Sharp 10 or before, um, when you have a read only struct, which means you're, you're creating a value type that is read only, so it's, it's uh, immutable. Um, and we're also using the init keywords. If you don't know what that is, it's from the previous version of C-sharp. You can have properties that are initialized only, which means you can only set them from the constructor or from the object initializer. You could maybe think, why just why don't leave out the set? I don't want to set them, but then you can only set them from the constructor. And if you are using an object initializer, you're in, you're in trouble. So since the last version of C-sharp, C-sharp 10, we have the initialize keyword, which means you can also set it from the object initializer. Now, if you do this with a struct, you basically get a compile error on your uh, class constructor. And I can show you very quickly by opening the project file and changing, um, um, maybe the, if I change the .NET version, I'm not sure. Hopefully this works. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. If you open this in an older, oh, it does. Um, in an older version of uh, .NET or uh, Visual Studio, you will have a, an, an error. The compiler will give you an error because basically you don't. You are not setting all of the properties. It says the auto-implemented property date dot date must be fully assigned before control is returned to the caller. So you must set it. Now, bas basically, in in, um, in C Sharp 11, they made a change that it will just get its default value, which could make sense. Um, so now the compile error is gone, and you can um, just ignore the fact that you're not setting a date. Um, that's the idea. So that's already one new feature in C Sharp um, 11. Then I was pretty excited about this one, um, auto fields. But 
I learned last week that it still doesn't work. So if you do auto properties, um, the cool thing about auto properties is you don't have to write a lot of code, but sometimes you want to make small adjustments in the setter or the getter for your properties. So instead of needing to uh, define the private field yourself, you can just use the field keyword and the field keyword will be this dark blue keyword and then the compiler will generate the field for you, uh, which should be easy. But then last week I learned that Microsoft postponed this feature to C Sharp 12. So see you next year. Um, a very, again, a very small little uh, feature, which um, a, c a couple of C Sharp versions ago, I can't remember how many, but we were able, instead of using uh, the, the literal strings like the quotes, we could do name of a variable or a class. Say, I, I just want the name of this class, this name of. But the name of only works when inside of the scope where that variable is live. So basically, if you want a string that has, like, if you throw... Um, a null reference exception, or no, an argument null exception, for example. An argument exception actually expects the name of the argument. So in the past, we would do something like this, but this give, gives me the goosebumps. So finally, we were able to do name of, and then the compiler would change that into the string value. Um, but the new thing in C Sharp 11 is that you can use this on top of methods for the parameters of those methods, or the arguments of those methods. Basically, this is out of scope, because this attribute lives out of the scope of this method. But finally, today, it will work in this specific case. So the name of for your parameters will work out of the scope for your method. Well, basically, it's in the scope of the method, because the attribute is on top of that method. But that's the idea. Generic attributes, another one. So finally, in C Sharp 11, we can create our own custom attributes deriving from, of course, the base class attribute. Um, and we can make it generic. So you can have an attribute of T. You could actually do the same thing uh, in, in earlier versions of C Sharp by, for example, adding a, a, a t, um, well, basically it's what, what this does. It's adding a type um, property and you could set that type inside of a constructor by doing type of, for example. But does, that doesn't look very clean. Um, so now you can actually use that generic um, concept of doing generic custom of int instead of type equals type of int. Now why would this have some benefit next to the fact that it looks better? Well, yeah, basically you can also add um, constraints. So I can do where t is a class. And then in here you will see that you now have a compile error. So int, I cannot use that as, a, uh, as a, uh, an, uh, an attribute because, not an attribute, um, a type parameter, uh, because it's not a class. So this is something new, again, um, that has the benefit that you can now add type constraints to this. Interpolated string holes, that's the weird one, but it's not that weird. So when doing interpolated strings, when you put variables inside of your strings and you interpolate them, you can basically now do as many new lines if you want, uh, as you want. So if you're the kind of guy that does 20, 20 empty lines between everything, you can now do that. So you just open your, um, whatever this is called in English or, su <laughs> or Swedish, um, and then have what, whatever expression you want, and then you can have it on multiple lines. So if you think the ternary operator for an if looks better like this, then you can write it like this without an issue. Um, maybe skip list patterns for now and go to the other string stuff. Um, this one, the UTF-8, you probably know um, things like when doing a, a float that you can do like 5f. 5f, the f postfix helps the C Sharp compiler um, to know that the 5 is actually a float value. So now var will not be an integer, but will be a float. Well, for um, read-only spans of byte, which is basically a binary um, representation of a string, it's just an array of bytes of characters, you can do the same thing. So instead of defining it 
by just using the binary numbers from the UTF table, um, you can just now add the postfix U8, and it will automatically convert that into that byte array, which can be useful in some cases, and it can actually help you with performance, because read-only spans are there for performance purposes. The final one with strings, and this is, this is a, a very weird one. Um, when doing string interpolation, um, this is something you can do from C Sharp 11 onwards. If you're using curly braces, which are used within string interpolated strings, uh, interpolated strings, um, you can do that. So you can basically write a piece of JSON inside of your string with the valid curly braces, um, which looks like a string, by just adding double dollar sign instead of a single. And then if you want to use um, actual variables interpolated within your string, you just need to add double curly braces in order to tell the compiler this is string interpolation. Now, things become interesting when you actually need, for some reason, literal double braces, curly braces. Now then you just add additional dollar signs and quotes. And you can go as many as you want. Um, this is why I told you it, it becomes a little bit weird. Um, of course, uh, then you also need three of these to interpolate your variables. Because now it's just a literal, literal string and you can add triple, open, triple, close. And now again the compiler knows that this is interpolated and this is literal. So if you like your 32 uh, curly braces. <laughs> Have fun with that. Now let's go back to the list patterns. This one, I'm, this one I think is, is pretty cool. Um, you know that in C Sharp and previous versions of C Sharp, they always add patterns for you to, to write code more compact. Um, with the switch, they did something cool. So let's say you have an, 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 an array of integers and you want to switch based on whatever is inside of that array. Um, you can do that now in all kinds of crazy ways. I can do something like, if the array of integers, integers starts with a one and a two, then whatever is inside, and then it ends with a 10, I want to do this one as a result. So this is, it starts with one and two, there's something in between, can be one number, can be no numbers, can be many numbers, but it should end with 10. This one is literal, it just needs to be an array containing only one and two, this is, it needs to contain uh, one in, in the beginning, and at the end, something else, but only one value, and we use the discard operator. So this is an array of size two, but I don't care about the last element. This is an array that can be whatever size, it starts with one and whatever is final, and this is whatever. <laughs> this is an array containing whatever. Um, so very cool. And with that, you can also capture pieces of your array. You can do switch on that array, it needs to start with one, two, and then a third element. I don't, it doesn't matter what the element is, but I want to capture that element, and then whatever comes behind. And then you have captured the third element. Here, the second uh, example, it needs to start with one, then it has some kind of middle, and then it ends with some kind of value, but only a single value. But whatever is in between, I want to capture. And then again, you have an array containing the middle of your array, basically. Can be one, two, three, as many as you want, um, number of values. And then in this final one, final one does the same thing, basically says, um, it's an array, capture everything inside of the array, which is all. Doesn't make sense, really. But it's something that you can do. Um, for some reason, the extended name of scope and name of method parameters is exactly the same example. I think I drank a little bit too much with this. Um, and then we have required properties. So, um, I new keywords, new keywords, so many keywords. Um, a couple of years and our code will completely be in dark blue. Um, but, yes, when we create classes or records, we can do initialize only, that's what I told you already. Now, if you have a bunch of properties like this, um, 
you can add the required keyword to tell the compiler that these properties are required. So if you are using that class and you are not setting these properties either from the constructor or from the object initializer, you will get an error. So here you can see I'm creating a new person and I'm only, um, I'm only sub submitting the name. But the first name is also required. And I, now I get a compile error. Required member first name must be set in the object initializer or constructor, which can be nice. Um, if you want to to um, to have this compiler error um, because the property is required and especially when you're using records for example which are immutable um, you may want to force the users of that record to actually set those values now something that I think is a little bit weird um, I made another class student which derives from person which has an additional required property called school which school are you attending or you enrolled in whatever um, if that uses a constructor and you're using that constructor and you can see that the constructor sets all of the properties name first name and school then you still get the error because for some reason the c-sharp compiler is not smart enough it doesn't see that you have you're using a constructor that is setting all of the fields you need to add the additional attribute that se says that this constructor sets all of the required members and then that um, error will go away. So that's a little quirky, um, but it's something that you have to do if you're using constructors. Um, and there's, there's no in-between. There's either this constructor sets all of the required members or it says sets none of the required members. So yeah, you have to look out for that. And we're already through. These were all the C-sharp features. So what's next? Link ordering, list that's the C sharp thing and rate limiting. Okay, so let's go to link, which is also a very simple one. So um, before .NET 7, when you wanted to order some data, for example, this data is just an enumerable range of numbers from zero to nine. Um, if you want to order that, you have to order it by itself. So X arrow X. You, you're not ordering it by a property, you're ordering it by itself. So finally, finally we have a method called just order, not order by. So this was not available up until .NET 7. So in .NET 7 you can finally order something on the data itself instead of a property of that data. So you can order ascending, which is just order, or order descending, these two. That's it. Rate limiting, that's a, that's a big one. Um, let's start with the concurrency limiter. So a rate limiter you can use for, 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 for whatever purpose. Uh, basically you're limiting something. Um, so in this case we're using a concurrency limiter. There's multiple limiters. Uh, let, let me first show you that. Eh? You have concurrency limiter. We all understand what concurrency is. So something can only happen an amount of time at the same time. So you're limiting the concurrency, but you also have stuff like fixed window and sliding window concurrency, where if people are doing stuff at the same time, you basically run out of tokens, and then when some time elapses, you, you release uh, a couple of tokens so people can do the same thing again. So this is what the rate limiting is all about. And the thing is, you create an instance of a rate limiter, and you give it some kind of uh, options. In this case, because we're doing a concurrency limiter, um, we're going to create concurrency limiter options. So we say it's it's permitted to only do concurrency for five things at the same time. And um, if something comes available, the or the, the oldest will uh, the oldest which is in line will come uh, as the next item. And then there's also a queue limit, which means that if things are not allowed to be uh, processed concurrently they can stand in a queue to wait for some spot to become available. You can put this to zero, which means that if this room is full, people, need to, people can't wait and they're, I don't know, killed or something. Um, but if you set the queue to two, people can stand outside of this room in a queue up until that limit of two. Um, so that's the idea. Now I did a little example here with the parallel for each to do stuff um, in parallel. I, I will do it with uh, an uh, enumerable range of, of 10 items. So we will we'll do 10 things at the same time. And you ask your rate limit, your rate limiter 
for a lease. So you attempt to acquire a lease. And attempting to acquire um, will basically succeed or it will fail in a synchronous way. You need to use the using statement because if you acquire a lease, whenever you go out of scope, you release that lease. Um, so it can be given to somebody else that is waiting for that lease. Um, so that's why you need to use the using keyword because it's a disposable um, lease. Now, if you acquire it, immediately you will get yes or no. So it will be acquired and then you can do whatever you want or it will be denied um, and then you do something different, uh, some, some uh, handling logic that you choose yourself. But there's also another way to do the same thing. It's by acquiring asynchronously, which means that you need to use the await keyword and if a queue is permitted, in our case, we have a queue permission of two, you basically asynchronously wait until a lease becomes available and then you will acquire that lease um, until you run, when the queue is full, for example, because we only allow two um, processes or people to be inside of the queue. When you're the third one, it will be den denied. It will be denied immediately. And that's the idea for all of these uh, limiters. So you can use that in whatever place in your code. It's not specific to uh, web services, for example. You can use this like the concurrency limiter in your application if you want to do things concurrently, but only four things or 50 things or, or whatever. If you look at the other ones like fixed window and sliding window and token bucket, they are quite similar. There, you always have the limiter with the options. Then you have my, my demo, which requests a lease. And then you have the synchronous version and the asynchronous version. What the, the, the bucket one basically uses a timer where you can have a replenishment period. So you have a bucket of 50, for example, um, things come in, you run out of those 50 items and then after X seconds or minutes or whatever, you replenish and you can replenish um, with a few tokens. You can like tokens per per period means after one second, you get all 50 back or only one back or 10 back, whatever you want. Um, the reason there is an auto replenishment is because you can even customize the replenishment. If you have multiple limiters, you can make them all use the same timer if you want and then they can be replenished all at the same time. But if you just do auto replenishment equals true, then the rate limiter itself will use an internal timer and will do that for you. Um, so a lot of customization options for you there. Now, if you are a, a very happy, crazy developer, you can use the partitioned rate limiter. Basically, you create a policy. And you create a policy based on whatever, it can be a string or an enum, um, and you have a limiter that can internally use the fixed window, the token bucket, or no limiter based on what policy you're, you are using. So you can acquire a lease and then specify what policy you want to use. This can be quite handy in ASP.NET, for example. When you do a web API, you have multiple endpoints. You can use the same rate limiter, which is a partitioned rate limiter. And for a very specific endpoint, you can say this is not rate limited. So you can, by using an, an enum or, or some kind of string attribute on top of your um, endpoint, you can say that it defaults to the no limiter. But another endpoint can, for example, use the sliding window and another one can use the concurrency. So you can fully customize the rate limiter by using this partitioned rate limiter. This is an example in ASP.NET. Uh, this is just a, a minimal API one. Um, you basically add the use rate limiter extension method on your uh, application, on your web application. Um, you have the options. You specify in the options what kind of limiter you want to use. Um, in this case, it's just a simple token bucket limiter with all of its um, options. And then on your endpoints, you just add the um, fluent method call require rate limiting and you pass what kind of limiter you want to use. So this is just a string, um, which is a policy which is called limited um, that you define on your rate limiter options. So this policy is the limited policy and you use that limited policy on this endpoint. That's, that's it. Again, when you use the partitioned limiter, you can, you can go crazy with all of your endpoints. Or you can just string these. You can just do it like this, add multiple limiters with other policy names, which does the same thing. 
Alrighty, what's next? Re regular expression source generations. Source generators, sorry. Ah, uh, yes. This one. So, in order to work with regular expressions, um, you just define a, a regex instance and you give it um, your regular expression and then you can use that regular expression to match whatever input um, you want to work with. Now, of course, when you run your application, this needs some dynamic thing to happen because you run your application um, and in, in memory you need to build all of the logic to actually match that regular expression to your input because you don't know what input is coming in, um, which can take a little bit of time. Um, we are working in .NET, which means .NET is compiled um, just in time, which means all of this needs to, to, to use uh, maybe some kind of reflection and, and, and stuff like that. Now, a couple of versions of .NET ago, uh, Microsoft introduced the concept of source generators. And source generators um, is basically a piece of the c -sharp compiler that will generate source for you at the moment you compile your code. Um, and this is what this uh, Regex uh, source generator actually does. You define a method, whatever name, my regular expression, which returns a regular expression, and this method is partial. It's just like a partial class. Uh, you, you can write a partial class and you can have another partial class with the same name and those are basically the same class. With a method, it's the same thing. You can have a partial method, which has no body whatsoever here, but it can have a body somewhere else if it has the same name and it's inside of the same class. Now, a source generator can add source, um, so it can basically add the body to this method. So we define that by using the attribute generated regular expression, we add the regular expression we want to use with some regular expression options. And that's the only thing we need. Now, if you compile this code, the c -sharp compiler inside of its pipeline will know that it now needs to generate source code. So you can actually see that if you open the compiled um, binary file, so the compiled DLL, which is this one, and you open up your own code, and you can see that my method regex my regex had now has a body because the, the compiler, the C-sharp compiler, generated the body for this method. And it's a very simple one. It says return um, my regex underscore zero dot instance. So my regex underscore zero is a class that I have not created. So I can search inside of my um, binary file. I can see that there's a namespace system dot text dot regular expressions dot generated, which is not something that I created. Okay, this is, this is the one that's actually being called. This is a singleton class because it has a private uh, constructor and it has that instance uh, property that returns a new instance. And then it has all of this logic. So basically this source code is generated in order to be able to match your regular expression to your input. Um, and the, the reason it's more performance is of course this is generated code by the compiler and when you, for example, um, ahead of time compile your application for a very specific architecture, this will all be generated into actual machine code, which is more performant. And that's the reason if you really, if you're really working with applications where performance is important, using source generators helps you to be able to ahead of time compile your application to machine code to make it more performant. That's the idea. And it's with all source generators. You will see if you open your, um, your binary files that a lot of this source is generated. It's, it's ugly source. I don't want to write this as a developer. So it's good that there's something like a source generator. I'm not sure about this one, but sometimes yeah. So if you're using source generators, there are they're always part of a NuGet package you're using or part of the framework itself. And you will find them um, as part of your references or analyzers. In this case, it's an analyzer. And if you open that analyzer, you can actually see the generated code. So it's not like in the old days of, 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 um, of .NET and C Sharp, where the generated files are just part of your solution and they are checked in into source control and all the ugliness that comes with that. No, they are generated when you compile your code. So they're not 
available as a file, they're available right there with the .g.cs um, extension, which tells you that it's a generated file, and you can just open that right here. So you can see what is generated, but it, it does not get checked in. It will, it will get generated in memory by the compiler. Basically, every time you do, you make a change in your code, it recompiles and it will regenerate the source generators, which is cool. JSON, no, the JSON additions and then the transcoding. Where is it? One up? Yes, that's the transcoding. And then the JSON. Can't find it. This one's. So what is added to JSON? Very simple things. Um, actually, only two things. You can now have a customized uh, maximum depth of your JSON serializer and deserializer. So if for some reason, uh, you, you all know that if you're using Entity Framework um, and ASP.NET Web API, for example, and you do and you have a, 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 a loop reference inside of your entities, then it tries to uh, serialize, it, serialize that as JSON and it goes, oh, this is a property. And then, oh, this goes back to that. This goes back to that. And it will do that until it reaches some kind of maximum. Um, you are actually not able to change that maximum. I can't even remember, it's 64 maybe. Um, now you can change that maximum depth and you will basically, basically get an exception when you reach that maximum depth. Depth. So if I run this example code, it will give you that exception because you have reached that maximum depth. So you can now change it. You probably also know that on the HTTP client, you have a bunch of extension methods that can help you to use the HTTP client and um, um, get data, post data as JSON. So you can uh, automatically um, serialize and deserialize your data as JSON. Now, there was no method for patching. And there is now in .NET 7. Finally, we have a method called patch as JSON, just like we have put as JSON and post as JSON, stuff like that. So these two are, are the two new JSON additions. And then we have some customization options. Um, if you, for example, have a class person that has a member name, but it doesn't have a property name. It has uh, methods for setting and getting that name value. Um, you can now customize your JSON serializer and deserializer to know about those methods. And so there is no property, so the JSON serializer by default cannot change your field because it's private. Um, but it should use these methods get name and set name if you have some additional logic inside of them. This, this example is crap because it doesn't really do anything. Um, but if you have some customization there, um, you can now use those methods. You basically use the serialize and deserialize um, methods on top of your JSON serializer, but you um, submit additional options. And with it, within these options, you can customize your JSON type resolver. And this uses a method that I've defined here that just says in, in this example case, if my type for my JSON equals uh, a person, or if it not equals a person, ignore. Um, but if it equals a person, then there is a property called name. So this is the JSON property name, the, the literal thing inside of your JSON, which is called name. Um, and there is a getter for this JSON property, which should call the method get name on top of your object. And if you are setting that JSON property, you need to call the set name. On. So you can customize the whole pipeline, the whole JSON pipeline, by just using these info resolvers. So then we have the gRPC JSON transcoding. Who doesn't know gRPC? Okay. Very quickly, um, we all know ASP.NET Web API where we can have HTTP endpoints and we're using HTTP to communicate data. And we're, today we're using mostly JSON sending across the network. Um, gRPC is another kind of technology that, that does something similar. We can um, we can call programs over a network, um, but we're doing it just like WCF did it back in the days, like a remote procedure call. So we're not calling endpoints and resources, no, we're calling actual methods through a network. And with gRPC, you create what is called a protobuf file. 
um, which describes what your service and service contracts look like, just like a WSDL with WCF. Um, so we have a service called Greeter. This one has a remote procedure call called Say Hello, so a method Say Hello. It takes a request and it returns a reply. Actually, this is what it looks like normally. And then you have those objects. We have a, a, a request object that takes one item which, or one uh, field, which is a name, and we have an, a reply which takes a string, one item, which is the message. The equals one is a little bit weird, um, but it's the order. It's the first um, property of your object. The reason for this is because in gRPC, we're not sending JSON or XML, no, we're sending binary. And because it's binary, we need to define the types of all of our fields and the order of all of our fields. And now we can just have a, a stream of binary data that, that both the server and the client can, can talk about because we described what they look like just here. I actually like gRPC to do process-to-process um, -process communication. And if you're communicating between your services internally, if you write both of your services, this is basically more performant than doing HTTP and JSON because the binary payload is smaller and the protocol is faster. Um, the problem with gRPC is if you create an ASP.NET gRPC application, you can't just open your browser and test. You can't just hit an endpoint and see the JSON because it's a binary format and it uses HTTP2, which your browser doesn't support. Um, so you just can't do stuff like that. That's why when you create a new project like this, it will automatically generate one endpoint for you on the root which says communication with gRPC endpoints must be made through a gRPC client. You cannot do that from your browser. So this is what you will see in your browser when you run this application. Now with .NET 7, because this is included in .NET, it's part of .NET, um, in .NET 7 you can just add this little option. And this little option maps this specific remote procedure call into an additional endpoint with this URL. So you create an additional endpoint that you can hit um, using your browser. So you have both options now. So you can do testing from your browser or people who don't know how to talk to your PC can still communicate with your application through that HTTP endpoint, but you also have the actual gRPC endpoint for improved performance and um, other things that you can have with um, gRPC. By the way, gRPC also supports streaming in both directions, so multiplex streaming, um, of course something that you cannot uh, map into an endpoint. So this is only for your regular um, request response kinds of applications. I can very quickly run this. <laughs> Use Visual Studio and very quickly in the same sentence. Or not. Sorry. Um, yeah, if you run this basically by just going through that endpoint, it will call your, your actual uh, service. Um, so if you don't know gRPC, this is the server side you have, by the way, by using source generators, just like WSDLs and WCF did in the, in the past, they would generate source code for you for client and server. This does the same thing. But now it's a source generator and you don't have to see um, the actual code. But you just implement from a base clause that is being generated for you. This is the actual implementation for that remote procedure call. And if you do a client, again, it looks very similar to WCF um, channels and, 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 and stuff like that by using the interface. You have the gRPC channel, um, which has the URL, and then you use that channel to create a client, and then you can send your request object just like you, you, you would call a C-sharp method. This is just an asynchronous C-sharp method, but it will actually call your server with your request and it will give you a response. Very cool. So five, min five more minutes remaining. What else do we have? Built-in container support. Again, something very simple, just, just nice that it's, that it's here. I prepared a very small, um, no, it's not, um, sorry. Oh yeah, built-in container support. I'm sorry. Um, so, we all know Docker, we all know containers, and we know that tools like Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code support, um, uh, have support for, for containers. So you can right click something and you can add the Docker file, which uh, has all of the necessary information about creating a Docker image. Um, but you need to add that and you need to change that manually if necessary. Now, since .NET 7, um, it's actually 
a part of the .NET SDK. So I can do .NET um, publish, .NET publish for the operating system Linux with the architecture of uh, 64 bits. And I, I can add an additional param parameter that says that my publish profile needs to be the default container. So it needs to be a container. And if you do this, .NET will not only build your executable, but it will build the entire container for you. And it will know what base image to use because it knows what SD kind of SDK project you are using. If it's just a console application, it will, it will use uh, the correct .NET runtime base image. But if you're using ASP.NET, like a web API or an MVC application, um, it will actually use um, that base uh, container uh, image for that. It will now, of course, you need to have some kind of uh, container runtime installed on your machine. I have Docker for Windows, so it will now have, it will now cr create uh, a Docker image, a Docker image that I can run. So I can do Docker run like this, Docker run. Um, it's, this is actually an example that uses uh, a web API. Um, so it, by default, it's port 80, and I'm going to map it to port 5050 on my local machine. And this is the name of that uh, container. The name of the container is always created based on the name of your project. So if you look at the project itself, which is here, it is called, like with the, the base namespace, uh, Sweatwig 2022, built-in container support. So that will also be the name of your uh, Docker image, but then all in small letters. And then of course the, the version tag uh, in the end. So this is cool for like developer use. So if you just, if you're, if you like using containers locally, um, you just do .NET publish or you make it into a publish profile uh, for your Visual Studio. You don't have to worry about the Docker files. Um, it will just work by running that single command and it is a container that you can run locally. Two more minutes. Open. Well, basically, we, I think we only have the, the upgrade assistant left, which again is also something simple. I prepared um, a .NET framework application, a .NET console application, um, and by using the upgrade assistant, you can upgrade this to .NET Core, which is basically .NET 6 uh, for now, uh, because .NET 6 is still the current uh, latest version uh, of .NET. And it's a command line tool you can install, and I hope they will make it a part of .NET 7 SDK. Um, where you, when inside of, of this kinds of uh, applications, so this is the .NET framework um, sample application that I've created, I can do upgrade assistant, upgrade, and then the name of your solution or project. So if I do it for the solution, it will basically give you a command line list of questions that you need to answer uh, to upgrade your project. It works very well with console applications because yeah, it's basically the same thing in .NET Framework and .NET Core. Of course, some, some Nougat packages or some namespaces are not available, so it, the, the upgrade assistant will tell you it, um, and it will t also tell you what the options are to solve that issue. Um, but here you can see that, it's, that there's a whole list of things that it needs to do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And it will ask you, apply the next step, back up your project. It's always a good thing, the first thing to back up your project. Um, yeah, use the default path. And then it's the second thing. Convert your project file into an SDK kind of file. So we have the, the, the large .NET framework project file and we'll now convert it into a .NET 6 project file. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And now it says we need to add a NuGet package called .NET Upgrade Assistant. So it needs to install a package that will do the actual upgrade. And yeah, that's that's the idea. You you just go through all of these steps, and then when your um, application is successfully converted, it will use Roslyn analyzers to tell you what things you still need to do manually. Because indeed, when there is a NuGet package that you're using which is not available for .NET Standard or .NET Core, and then you need to change it manually, but then you have an, an analyzer that will tell you this ne still needs some, some work from you as a developer. Um, and I tested it for console applications for WinForms and WPF, works fine. For ASP.NET, it's a little bit more difficult because ASP.NET changed uh, thoroughly from .NET Framework to .NET Core. So there it, it needs some manual work uh, to actually work. For MVC, for example, MVC doesn't, doesn't do a very good job. 
uh, because lots of things like bundles and uh, stuff like that in ASP.NET framework don't exist in uh, core. Um, so there you need to do a lot of stuff manually. And with that, I am unfortunately out of time. Um, so thank you.